I had to chuckle when I was thinking about what to say about the second principle, justice and equity and compassion. It strike me, strikes me that it's so Unitarian to start off with the big words and, so, and to have the small words come later. Justice, equity, compassion. <laughs> Who really knows what justice means even though we talk about it so often? And then comes equity, which we might mix up with equality, but it simply means fairness, and that's easier. And then we get compassion, the only one that refers to a feeling, meaning it's more immediate within us. I think we wrote this one backwards, compassion, equity, and justice in human relations, because that's how we move from the principle about the individual person and in ourselves to how we want to behave in our relations right around us to how we want to exercise ourselves in a broader world. When we begin to live our life on the basis of our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, at least, at least when we have the time, then we begin to develop a sense of connectedness, of fellow feeling, of empathy, and even sympathy with each person we come across. We begin, to, we begin to look past the obvious differences and even to imagine how we would be in the other person's position. By doing this, we are drawn into living according to the second principle, if we think of it as beginning in compassion. The way we want to be in our relations with other people begins with the impulse to feel compassion, to recognize others as more like ourselves than different. This impulse becomes infused with gratitude for all that we have and that we desire for others. And then it overflows. We, we begin to feel compassion for many others and to feel strongly about the welfare of the group bringing us to the ideal of equity. And when we look beyond the group to the masses, the values of compassion and equity expand into the even higher level of justice. As the Reverend Dr. William Schultz puts it, spirituality is the inspiration for all politics that redeems. For once I have have looked on the abundance of creation, I cannot rest while others caught up in its flaws are deprived of the view. I try to imagine the second principle through the eyes of children. It's a good place to start often, hoping that by doing so I can understand it at the simplest level. Human development studies now show us that infants are born with the innate capacity for compassion, at least as it is uh, revealed by the imitation of facial expressions. They're seeing and they're doing in a connection. And because we also know that you can alter your mood by changing your expression, really, a smile can lift your spirits. Now I've lost my place. Um, we actually start to feel how they feel. So babies, by imitating the expression, are having the proto-experiences of emotions along with those around them. As a social species evolved to cooperate in groups, it's not surprising that we have these innate behaviors to connect with others, to feel as they feel, even to understand them in the gut. Although for a number of years, we as children are also instinctively selfish in our meeting our own needs and the atmosphere, oh, excuse me, are instinctively selfish in our own drive to survive, I imagine that even as young children, when we feel secure that our own needs are met and the atmosphere around us isn't frightening for any reason, our first response to another child who is suffering is to feel with him or her sometimes even acting to comfort or soothe the other. 
While reading for this talk, I almost went down a rabbit hole, Googling images of infants and toddlers showing compassion. I thought I might show them. Click. Oh. <laughs> Click. Oh. Click. Oh. Do try this at home, boys and girls. <laughs> Do it any day you need an uplift. By the age of seven, it's clear that we start learning to be fair and know what fairness is. At this age, we, we become very invested in games with rules to be followed. Negotiating and defining these rules becomes part of the game itself. While serving North Shore Unitarians in West Vancouver, the director of religious education there had sleepovers in the church for every level of elementary uh, classes and the youth, of course. And they developed the tradition, the young ones, of playing flashlight tag as one of their first activities on Friday night. Every time, the first thing that they do is to define who will, define who will be it, what role, if any, is there for those who are found, how long the count is. And then Lynn Saverin, the DRE, sets the parameters of where is off limits, such as the pulpit. We have a bigger pulpit with space underneath. If she hadn't, in trying to hide, I might have gotten myself stuck under the pulpit instead of under the coat rack. And speaking of compassion, a few of the kids helped me get out, even in the middle of the game. Do you remember Fantasia, that scene with the hippos and the little tutus? That's me hiding under a coat rack. <laughs> when I think back to my eight-year-old play with other kids, I remember how often one of us is shouting, no fair, no fair. This might be because something actually is going wrong or someone's cheating, but sometimes it's about something vaguer than that, even something unintentional that just doesn't seem, well, fair. At this age, we also start learning how to share fairly. I cut, you choose, for instance. We begin understanding that sharing is a good thing, not just for me, but for you and others too. Compassion has grown into this sense of fairness and impartiality, which is a sense of what equity is. I have a harder time figuring out what a child's understanding of justice might be. First, I bet we learn it more easily in its absence. And that likely begins when we start to recognize unfairness at a larger level than our own lives. And this probably happens at a wider variety of ages, depending on what we're exposed to and on how adults around us think and feel. But no doubt also simply on happenstance. Maybe there's one student, this happened in my life, maybe there's one student in a classroom that is too frequently criticized in a harsh tone that's never used for any other student. Maybe this is a first hint about what justice is. Disadvantaged children learn about injustice a lot faster than privileged ones who might never learn it at all. For me, it begins around the age of 10 or so when I first hear about the Holocaust and the civil rights movement in the American South. Now, my family is good friends with a number of Jewish people in Fredericton, and we know some others who are African-Canadian. But I know this isn't about them exactly. This is about out there. It's a much bigger thing and therefore unbelievable and outrageous in, even in a 10-year-old way. Eventually, though, for all of us, the playing fields get bigger and bigger. Competition overtakes compassion and becomes serious enough that the skilled and the less skilled aren't treated equitably anymore. The rules are set by others without negotiation. Vested interests start to have more say than regular people. Insecurity about resources leads some to grab and keep more than their fair share. 
The insecurity can be buried so deeply that greed and acquisitiveness become habits, and only the powerful can set the rules about what's fair. Somewhere along this route towards societal complexity, not only fairness, but justice too is lost. What that means is truth and reason too start to be ignored. Certain facts are overlooked, distorted, or compartmentalized. Reasoning becomes rationalization. What's more, not everyone is aware of the values we hold fundamentally, so we can think we're arguing about facts when we really are expressing different values. Ones that if we could make them explicit, we could understand, if not agree upon. It can all go so very wrong. Now, the last time I spoke here, I observed that justice as we seek it in our legal systems is often a very narrow arrow, arrow aiming to identify a single point or maybe a few single points. Our justice system doesn't bring about justice. It exercises ideas of right or wrong, reward and punishment. So many powers, influences and factors vibrate around these narrow arrows, but can only rarely have an effect on outcomes. In Canada now, we are striving to make some corrections to this, such as moves towards uh, using um, restorative justice for offender, uh, youth and indigenous offenders and uh, culture, uh, culture uh, informed uh, ways of dealing with uh, offenders of various kinds. Something to be proud of is that Canada is far beyond most other Western countries in doing this. Although, of course, we're far away from getting it just right. In writing about this second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, the Reverend Dr. Richard Gilbert observes that the spiritual life must express itself ethically. He looks back at history to see the very high standard of this concept that the proto-Unitarians in Poland adhered to in the 16th century. If you don't know about that, you should read it, read up about it. Um, I'm forgetting the place it was in, it starts with R. But there was a, a, a groundswell of Unitarian thinking in the middle of Poland, in the middle of the 16th century. It was called the Minor Church of Poland because there was a major church. Guess what that was. And the Minor Church stressed the idea of covenant, meaning the behavioral promises made between believers, the practical applications of religious, religious principles to daily life. Now get this, each person was called to account every three months. Each was interviewed personally so that faults and errors could be clearly identified and appropriate confessions and acts of repentance made. Now, how would that be for a requirement of membership? <laughs> Gilbert goes on to quote another UU minister, Harry Miservi, who asked, if you were arrested for being a Unitarian Universalist, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> I hold up a mirror. The point Gilbert is getting to is that our principles must be seen as calls to action and not as mere concepts or lofty standards to sit back and admire. To be spiritual in the light of this principle includes feeling some pull towards outrage that calls us to, to transform our compassion into work towards equity and justice. Now, I'm the first to admit that many of you are far more spiritual in this way than I am. My spiritual pull is, I humbly hope, towards inspiring, educating, maybe triggering, triggering others to find their own spiritual pull. This is just the way I'm built spiritually. And it's not the hard way that many of you are devoted to. 
Now, in a bit, we're going to sing about the kinds of people we are and hope to be in the face of inequity and justice, and we need to sing about it. Despite the news and the issues, despite the outrage that our spiritual values and principles uh, rightly trigger in us, despite the battles that slope up steeply in front of us, it's crucial that we hold on to the hope and motivation that come from singing of a better world. When we see the challenge so clearly, it is vital we are reminded that bit by bit, our compassion can bring about more equity and justice in all human relations. Let me reiterate the opening words from this morning. When all the people of the world love, then the strong will not overpower the weak, the many will not oppress the few, the wealthy will not mock the poor, the honored will not disdain the humble, and the cunning will not deceive the simple. May we make it so.